Welcome to the Field of 68s Off the Carousel, where we're checking in with new coaches across college basketball. And at the age of 44, Alan Huss has been a star in this industry, and now he gets his chance to be a head coach in college hoops at High Point University, the new head coach of the Panthers joining us now. And Alan, before we talk about High Point, I want to look back about two decades ago when you are at Eisenhower High School in Illinois. I believe I read you started out coaching as, what, a part-time freshman coach? Tell me about the beginnings. That was, uh, I had no plans to coach to coach college basketball, high school basketball, really any basketball at all. And I ran into an old friend, Jeremy Moore, uh, walking around and, uh, with my wife at the time. And uh, we chatted up a little bit. He mentioned that he was looking for a freshman coach at Decatur Eisenhower. Uh, he had coached my youngest brother there. Uh, and and I knew Jeremy. I grew up watching him play. He was a couple years older than me. So I knew Jeremy and his family for a lot of years. Uh, and yeah, he offered me an opportunity to come be the freshman coach. And that's, that's where it all started. It was fun. What were you planning on doing? I just worked in the business world. I had a regular job. And uh, if, yeah, if it wasn't for running into Jeremy, I'd probably still be doing the same thing I was doing. I'd be sitting at a desk. Doing what, you think, in the business world? Probably underperforming. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Luckily, I've moved into a space where I where I fit in a little bit uh, a little bit better than I did in that one. So you end up going through the the high school ranks. Decatur Christian comes up next, so six, so seven. Then you're at Culver Military and La Lumiere, and then you end up as as an assistant at New Mexico. I guess as this journey's going on, you went from not planning on doing it at all to Today, you're a college head coach. How did that happen when you think about this journey? You know, it's 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 difficult to to not think that there's a, a obviously a, a greater power out there that's directing things when you when you look, especially at my situation. I know we all feel that way about our individual situations, but you know, it, it's just it's 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 crazy. I mean, I, I just. I think maybe that's why it's worked out for me. It's just, I, I never was worried about the next job because I didn't really think there was a next job. But when I started off as a, uh, as a, as a freshman coach, I think the guys that played for me there and the, my, my colleagues at, at Decatur Eisenhower, uh, I think they would tell you that I, I treated it like it was a division one head coaching job. And I think I've done that every step along the way. I just, I didn't know any other real way to do it. Uh, I, I, you know, I'd only, only way I'd really, had modeled for me was just kind of to be all in and so yeah that's that's kind of the way I've attacked it and and it's just I've been saying I've, I've been really grateful to have a lot of people along the way that maybe saw me as something a little bit more I was still a part-time coach of, up all the way until I went to Culver Military Academy and uh, you know Mitch Henderson who was an assistant at Prince I mean an assistant at Northwestern at the time uh, Mitch helped me kind of get get going his great uncle was uh was on the board of directors at Culver and luckily Mitch thought maybe I was worthy of uh of, of running the, the show there and maybe might have might have slipped my name in there to kind of get me going there and then uh you know you fast forward to, to Craig Neal who thought of me as a college coach what a lot of other people thought of me as just a high school or AAU coach uh because I, you know, I coached a lot of grassroots basketball also uh but I just you know I love I love coaching and I love coaching young kids and trying to get them better. And it's just, it's pretty amazing that I get paid to, to do this now because I, I was doing it for free to start off. And then you met Mitch Henderson in the NCAA tournament in the sweet 16 of all places. And we kind of, we had a laugh. We were, we, the fleet gymnasium there at Culver where Mitch was a superstar back in the nineties uh, you know, seats probably, I think they say it seats 1200 and it probably seats more like 600, uh, you know, kind of jam full of, of military cadets, the, the cadets of the school, a lot of times, but it's, it's a neat place. We kind of laughed that as we were sitting in the yum center down in Louisville, that maybe it was a slightly bigger stage than, than, uh, the gym we had last shared there in Culver, Indiana. Let's stick with your roots and let's go to Creighton, uh, because you played for Dane Altman. You're a teammate of Kyle Corvers. 
I, I got to hear the the best story, your favorite memory of Coach Altman, maybe his favorite phrase that he used with you, something that comes to mind. And, and what led you to saying, yeah, I played for Coach Altman. I'll play at Creighton. Yeah, I mean, I think Coach would probably tell you my – what led me to playing there was just lack of other options. I wasn't very good. He was, he was, he was nice enough to give me an opportunity or maybe desperate enough, depending on how you look at it. Um, you know, he'd probably tell you, he'd probably tell you desperate. I might, I, I was hoping for maybe nice, but uh, I think that the, the thing at, at Creighton was really simple. It was, they, they told the truth in the recruiting process uh, Coach Altman came in and, and Greg Grinson, they came in and did a home visit at my house uh, in Kansas City at the time. And uh, they sat down with my parents and uh, I think everybody in the room, he told me about 15 things about me and they were all things I needed to do better. Uh, and I remember when he when he left, uh, my parents uh, my parents looked right at me. And so that's the guy, that guy, that guy tells the truth. And, you know, I think my dad as a former coach appreciated it. Uh, and it was a really simple, it was a really simple deal. Went up on an official visit there and met all the people. And, you know, many of the people that I met on that visit are the people that are still in and around Creighton basketball to this day, uh, despite the, uh, you know, for, for those of you that don't know, Creighton was not Creighton today when I went there. Uh, luckily for me, I would never have been there because I I couldn't play on these teams to get today. Is Kyle Korver the best shooter you've ever been around? Yeah, I mean, he was a pretty incredible shooter. Uh, you know, he's, he, yeah, he, he, he probably has to be, I guess. I mean, he's one of the greatest to ever do it. Uh, at, at Creighton, we had a lot of guys that could really shoot the basketball. And, and Kyle was, you know, he was just a sophomore when I was a senior and was figuring it out. Uh, still kind of how to do all the crazy things that he does now. He was more of a standstill guy early in his career. Uh, he became a guy that could really sprint and, and, and shoot the basketball off the move as he got, as he got older and stronger and uh, more seasoned, but he, he, he was trending that way. And uh, it's kind of funny. I remember him. I remember still this day, Saturday morning, him coming over on official visit with his parents. And uh, I think he, uh, he, he went like two for 25 from three that day and back rimmed every one of them, but you could just see the stroke. It was pure. And, uh, uh, even though he missed them all that day, it was pretty clear that he he was a special shooter and uh, probably more importantly, a special winner. Hmm. You, you think of winning and the guy that you just worked for comes to mind because Greg McDermott's done a lot of it. You come onto his staff in 2017. And at least from my vantage point, Alan, he's the guy that you sometimes say, is it real? Like, is this guy just always like this? He He's just your regular guy that, yes, challenges his players, but but you pretty much are getting the same every single day. Is that not the case? I'd say two things about that, John. Number one, his, commit to, his commitment to process is second to no one. He whether you've just won the biggest game of the year or lost the biggest game of the year, 30 minutes after the game, 20 minutes, as soon as he's done with media and we kind of sit as a staff briefly, just to start our, uh, you know, to start our kind of post game talks. You can't tell whether he's won or lost. He doesn't treat players any differently. He doesn't treat staff any differently. It's always about the process. Just what we, where we, where we went sideways, if we went sideways, what we did well, if we did things well and, whether it's win or loss, you know, it's just, it's, it's really looking at that process. And I think when you, when you stay focused on process, it's really easy to stay kind of on that even keel, you know, even keel lane where you just, you don't have the crazy ups and downs that, that, that a lot of coaches have in this, in this business. Uh, and I think I'd say the second part is just Mac has an ability to treat everyone that he comes into contact with with an amazing amount of, uh, you know, just he, he's interested in them. It's genuine. He takes, takes time out of his obviously really hectic schedule to engage them. And his ability to do that with pretty much everyone that comes in contact with him, regardless of whether they can do something to help him or not, 
is really the most incredible thing. It's just, it's, it's consistent all the time and it doesn't matter who you are or where you came from or what the deal is or what you can do for him. Uh, and you know, you, when you work in college basketball, that's inevitably a transition, you know, transactional business. Uh, it's really refreshing to be around a guy like that, you know, every day. And it's just, I think it's, it's impossible not to, to, to watch that model and, and to try to emulate it now that I've got an opportunity to do it on my own. Let's turn to that opportunity here. High point reaches out. You start having conversation with them. What made you like, not like, what made you love this job and say, okay, I can go coach there. And I can not only go coach there, we could win there. I think, I mean, I was so hyper-focused on Creighton at the time that I didn't have a chance to dig wholly in. Uh, when they when they initially reached out, uh, but I luckily I'd had some conversations with colleagues in the past. I knew about the tremendous facilities and the uh, administrative support and the, the excellence of the university. So I had like a little bit of a baseline knowledge kind of tucked away in the back of my brain. So when they reached out, I knew that there was an interest. But when I started having further conversations as we were progressing in the in in the NCAA run, uh, and I had an opportunity to meet. Uh, in more depth, uh, some of the administrators, the, the president of the university, Dr. Gabane, and uh, Dan Hauser, the director of athletics here. And I, I just saw that there was alignment from top to bottom. I think and when you pair values and alignment and facilities, you just kind of look around and you see excellence everywhere and you go, wow, well, if there's excellence everywhere, you know, then that, that there's certainly an opportunity to do that in men's basketball. And, and it just everything lined up and it Honestly, I, it also, it felt so uh, like there, there had to be something wrong. I'm still looking for what that is and hopefully it doesn't show itself anytime soon. <laughs> Every coach is going to have a different story here. So I want to hear yours. You take over this job and how many scholarships are you inheriting? How many guys did, did you know that you would have? Uh, and what has the last month of your life been like? filling out a roster. Yeah, John, it's been a little hectic. Uh, we've, we, we're going to end up with three scholarship players carrying over from the prior staff, uh, three walk-ons also. So we'll have six guys coming back this, uh, this summer that were with us this spring. Uh, obviously that leaves us with 10 spots to fill of which we've filled six so far. Uh, we've got four official visits this week. So, uh, it's going to be, it's, it has been extremely busy and hectic and all those things. And then it's going to continue to be for the, at least the next few weeks as we continue to find guys that can, that help fill things out. Alan, be real with, with me here, because I, I just, I don't think that the common individual understands this. They might be following some of the bigger leagues, but I'm, I'm not sure if our audience is as well versed on, on your big South programs and, and kind of, what you're recruiting, how you're conducting these visits and all that. Like, it, is it as real as everything else right now in the climate of college basketball of you're recruiting these kids and these kids could be getting offers to play elsewhere that that where NIL is impacting the entire equation? I would tell you NIL is very much involved in, in every level of college basketball at this point. So it's, it's, it's a new moving piece that uh, is another, you know, another hurdle for coaches to navigate and uh, families to try to understand. And so, yeah, that's, that's a big piece of it, just like it was at Creighton and just like it is at every, uh, every one of the 360 some odd division one programs in, in college basketball right now, it's, it's here to stay. And, uh, it's something that uh, we aim to to tackle here in the near future at High Point. You were part of a style of Creighton that was, hey, space, 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 uh, four out, one in. We're going to run the floor. How do you want to play at High Point? Yeah, I mean, I think the the simple answer is very similarly. Uh, I'd love to tell you that it was all coaching, and that's not a knock against me or uh, Coach Courtney Williams or Coach Miller or uh, Coach Mack, but we had some pretty darn good players. If you look at the NBA draft uh, 
uh, combine right now. I think there's what three of them that are in the combine right now. I'd like to say that's all coaching, but we both are smarter than that to know that we've had some really talented players at, at, uh, at Creighton. But I, what I'd tell you is that we will attempt to uh, play very similarly, try to, uh, it starts with pace. Uh, and you mentioned the spacing that comes with, with great perimeter shooting. Uh, and I think maybe the part that goes, uh, you know, overlooked a lot of times when it comes to Creighton is, and especially with this last group, uh, we really had an intelligent group. Uh, those, those guys, those, those five starters and those, you know, the, the end of the bench, we did, we had a group that really was able to take game plans and implement them. Uh, I think it started with the, with the backcourt, you know, those guys, but it was just every one of those guys just were, were elite at, with their ability to take what we were trying to do as a staff and implement it uh, and, and add their own little twists and turns to it and, and, and wrinkles to it. It was really a collaborative process. And I think that's why we had success there more than anything else, other than just the good piece, the good, the good players piece. Uh, but that's, that's the last piece of it is just trying to find guys that, uh, you know, that are willing to be bigger than some, be, be a part of something bigger than themselves. And that, that bring that intelligence to the floor, because there's no question that a, a huge part of the success at Creighton is largely due to that. All right, I had one question come in from the Creighton staff, and this is an important one. They asked, how does your wife think you look in purple? Oh, boy. Uh, I had uh, I had a nice purple shirt on in my initial press conference, and I was, uh, I was told that I looked like a big purple dinosaur uh, <laughs> by, a, by a number of people. So I've got a purple shirt on now. I'm still getting acclimated to the purple, but... Uh, <laughs> Look, I've got two daughters and a wife. I think they'll look better in purple than I do. And finally, because this is a big point here with your previous boss, because people would call him the best on the golf course. Uh, where's your golf game right now? How would you stack it up? Uh, I started last summer trying to play a lot. Uh, Coach Miller and, and I both did. We once the roster was in place, that was, I don't know, June, probably once we kind of had everything solidified last summer, we did start playing a lot more. Uh, I, I think it's going to have to take a one year uh, kind of pause, uh, but I do enjoy it. Uh, but to compare me to coach Mack and uh, our commitment to the game or our, our, our skills, that's, that's, that'd be an insult to coach Mack or anyone else that's decent at golf because I'm a subpar golfer at very best. The follow-up question would be, who's really building the roster at Creighton? I mean, who was, you know, because you have to work on your golf game at some point if you're going to be that good. No, Coach Mack is, uh, Coach Mack loves to chase that white ball, but the one thing I'll tell you about him uh, <laughs> is when it comes to recruiting, he he, li he likes to recruit even more. So, yeah. Uh, but I can tell you that he, he loves the result of that recruiting even more than both of them. He wants to win at a really high level, so. Uh, even though he chases that white ball around, it, it's it's getting worked around recruiting calls and, and trips and all those things. He 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 he's got his priorities in order. I can promise you that. Well, that dinger means our time is up. Alan Huss, congratulations on High Point. Looking forward to seeing you in purple more often in the 2023-24 college basketball season. Best of luck with the Panthers in year one. We're looking forward to watching you. Thanks, John. Really appreciate it.